David James. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a privilege to follow the Rival Member for Rochdale. I've followed him over the years many times, and whilst I may not always agree with him, he always speaks with level headed common sense, and that's a, a privilege for the House. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the proverb tells us the good die young. And in this House, that couldn't be more true than this year, with uh, three of our most valued members, David, Amos, James Brokenshire and Jack Dromey, uh, all leaving us before their time. Uh, and David Amos was a particularly close friend of mine, uh, and so it's a particular privilege to speak after his successor uh, in her storming uh, maiden speech. Indeed, when she was telling her Macintosh joke, I was reminded of a maiden speech about 30 years ago on those benches uh, uh, when uh, a rather striking red-headed uh, Scott Nat made a absolutely stonking speech, maiden speech, uh, and I think it was John Smith jumped up and said, that was no maiden speech, that was a brazen pussy of a speech. <laughs> well, hers was too elegant to say that of it. Um, uh, she was much more elegant than that. But I will say, but I'll say this to her. Uh, and perhaps it's the greatest compliment I can give her. And as I say, David would have been proud of me. Now, I want to make some simple points, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, fairly quickly. But uh, this, uh, yeah, there's a great deal to welcome in this Queen's speech, in 38 bills. And, and uh, those who have been poo-pooing them perhaps ought to think, uh, wait until they see the details of some of them. The tackling of economic crime, embracing the freedoms that Brexit offers, that's too late reforming and securing our energy supply, resolving the Northern Ireland legacy issues. These are all massively important issues, and there are many others like them, uh, which should get our undiluted support. There are some, uh, and the front bench will be disappointed if I did not say this, there are some which perhaps require more careful handling. For example, the online safety bill, a very, well, a very necessary and well-intentioned bill, but is so complex will have dozens of unintended consequences, including possibly curbing free speech unintentionally. So we have to make sure we give the time to that, uh, to look at it carefully. Similarly, the National Security Bill, undoubtedly a necessary bill, but we're going to have to handle it carefully because it, re it replaces the Official Secrets Act uh, and we must make sure it does it in a way which does not curb the rights of honourable whistleblowers, for example, uh, whilst protecting the state from uh, its enemies. Now, a Queen's speech is built on sand if it's not underpinned by strong economic foundations. Indeed, uh, uh, in the actual Queen's speech, uh, the, it said the government will drive economic growth to improve living standards and fund sustainable investment in public services. But taxes today are too high. So we need to get some fundamentals right. High taxes don't deliver growth, they stifle it. Yep. Low taxes deliver investment. Low taxes deliver higher productivity. Therefore, low taxes deliver growth. Therefore, low taxes is the preemptive answer to stagflation, which is the biggest threat on our horizon in the coming year. So I would say to the House, I rather agree with some of the points coming from some of the opposition benches about the need for an emergency budget. I don't agree with the argument uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, windfall taxes. I think that would defeat itself. But there's certainly need to act quickly. And the Prime Minister, I think, used the phrase deploying our fiscal firepower. Well, we need to deploy our fiscal firepower now when our constituents need it, not after they've already suffered uh, the increases in prices they face now uh, and the, the, the more that they'll face in the uh, latter part of the year. Now, this is a good Queen's speech. I will give way to me. And he's absolutely right that um, lower taxes now put money in the people's pockets to allow them to spend on the kind of things that uh, they are finding it difficult to spend on present. But is he worried that there seems to be this attitude using the fire power in a couple of years' time, coming up to the election, will be seen as cynical, rather than dealing with the issues now which are hurting people and hurting them badly. Exactly right. Uh, 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 it's quite plain. If we increase, for exa example, national insurance for a large part of the population, 
and that increases their suffering uh, in not being able to eat and heat the house at the same time. And then, one year before an election, we drop the income tax. I'm afraid in the working men's clubs of Yorkshire, that would be seen as a cynical uh, deployment of the state power. And I suspect the same in Belfast, and I suspect the same in the rest of Northern Ireland, where, as we've heard already, it's a bigger problem even than in the rest of the United Kingdom. So, uh, yes, absolutely, that's right, and that's why we should give the people their money back now. Uh, my right honourable friend, I'll give way to him, I was about to quote him. Would, would my right honourable friend agree that as there is going to be a big windfall element in extra North Sea oil and gas taxation, which already has a, a double corporation tax windfall element, and a big increase in VAT on domestic heating, and a big increase in, in tax on pump diesel and pump petrol, at least that money should be given back by other tax cuts. Yeah, my right honourable friend is right. I mean, in fact, so much so. He has been the, the mm. icebreaker in this argument. I refer to it as the Redwood argument. We have, we have uh, record tax collections this year, record tax collections because of fiscal drag and a variety of other reasons, uh, underestimates by the, by the Treasury, and that's the money we should give back to the people. We don't need to balance the budgets twice over. We need to get that right. Now, there are elements which uh, uh, I think we need to reinforce or increase of what the Queen's Speech is talking about. I mean, my favourite line in the Queen's Speech is the same one every year. It's other measures we put before you. Uh, and I want to speak just to those for a moment now. Um, we're Conservatives. We believe in a property-only democracy. And governments for 30 years, governments of all powers, all, all persuasions, and for 30 or more years since Margaret Thatcher, in truth, have failed in this regard. They've failed. Uh, my generation, two-thirds of people bought their own home. Today, it's a quarter. That is a scandal. And it's, uh, of course, you know, I approve of the Prime Minister talking about the right to buy for... Uh, for housing associations, I should do. I first came up with the policy in 2002, and it was my responsibility. And we still haven't done it. But that won't solve the problem. We're a million houses short, at least, uh, uh, in a period in which we've had seven million uh, people uh, increase in population. We're about 100,000 houses a year short in terms of what we're constructing, in addition to that million. So what we need to do is to find a way which doesn't hit what people call a NIMBY problem, but which is people talking about their own environment and protecting their own environment in objecting to things. You need to find a way around that, and I think we need to look very hard. This was done before in the 20s at garden villages and garden towns and using the increased wealth created by them to actually pay for the, uh, the resources, the community centres, the surgeries, the schools, the roads, the Wi-Fi. That is that is necessary. And there'll be plenty of added value uh, to make the farmers rich at the same time. So it, it, it would be politically, a, 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 not straightforward, but a, an easier policy uh, than uh, we might think. We're also believers in social mobility. I think the whole house are believers in social mobility. We used to be the best in the developed world. Used to be. Now we're amongst the worst in the developed world. Now, when inequality is greater, Social mobility is more important. Indeed, it's the only real moral argument for an unequal society. And that is that people, everybody has an opportunity. Everybody has a chance to take part. And so in the last 20 years or so, top 1% of the population have roughly trebled their income, whereas the median has roughly flatlined. So there's a stronger argument for social mobility today than also before. The best mechanism in social mobility, for social mobility, is the education system. And there are some very good proposals in the education bill in this, uh, this uh, Queen's speech. But uh, adding uh, the academy system will help at the margin, but it won't solve the problem. It hasn't solved it for the last 20 years, and it won't solve it now. The great scandal is that half of children from free school meals families, half of children from free school meals families are failed by the education system by the time they're 11. They can't meet the English or mathematical requirements to make progress in education. Their lives are effectively over in terms of social mobility at that point. 
We need to take a grip of that. That means re-engineering the classroom. It means helping our brilliant teachers with more artificial intelligence, more software support, more uh, augmentation. The technology is there now. It exists now, it's proven, it's available. Uh, I, I hope the House won't laugh too much when I said I went to see it demonstrated at Eton, of all places, uh, where, it was, where it was brilliant at bringing on the weakest children. I give way. I'm very um, grateful to my honourable um, uh, friend for, for giving way. Would you recognise, though, um, in terms of e educational attainment, if some child's hungry, um, because many of our children are hungry because they're living in, in poverty, it's not going to help them? Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, uh, I have arguments I'm not going to deploy today on universal credit and so on, which relate directly to that. But one of the outcomes, for example, of having uh, a technologically augmented teaching and assessment system is the teacher knows in days if the child has got a problem which he didn't have before. If suddenly, suddenly it's education performance starts, let's say because the parents separate or the trouble at home or it's going hungry or whatever it may be. So it, she's right, um, I agree with the basic premise, but this will help even with that if we do it. Now I want to see us do that uh, and, and deal with that scandal. The other area, the, the last area I want to speak about very briefly, is the fundamental question of health care. We all of us support the National Health Service. We all of us no doubt applauded the, the brilliant staff and the doctors and nurses who did a fantastic job. But we tell ourselves over and over again that we have the best health care system in the world. And it's not true. It is simply not true. We have those committed doctors. And we are now spending more than the OECD average on healthcare. More than the OECD average. But we are not delivering more than the OECD average. Whether it's uh, survival rates in all the different categories of cancer care, or whether it's coronaries, or strokes, or diabetes, or whatever, we are not doing as good a job as we should for the money, and the work, and the skill, and the commitment that goes into it. So my argument here is that we should look at the other, the other countries that are doing better than us, whether it's Germany or France or Estonia uh, or Austria or Sweden or Canada or Australia, have different systems. They're all free at the point of delivery. All free. I mean, I've been a beneficiary of the Canadian system, and it's an insurance-based system, but it's free at the point of delivery, and it's supported by the state if you can't afford it. And it works better than our system. And I think we need to look at those other systems and learn from them and stay with the fundamental principles of the health service, but actually learn and improve what we have. I'm, I'm, I'm just about to sit down, so she, she'll forgive me. So we need to rebuild ourselves. We on this side need to rebuild ourselves as a party of low taxes, as a party of and for homeowners, as a party of aspiration and opportunity and security. It's time for a new model conservatism, fit for a new Britain in a new world.